Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Jenin, and I am one of the sports medicine physicians at Cleveland Clinic, and we're here today to talk to you a little bit about rotator cuff tendinopathy. And it's our pleasure to discuss with you the method and the approach that we've taken to treatment of both rotator cuff tendinopathy as well as calcific tendinopathy of the shoulder and how you may utilize minimally invasive tenonomy in your practice. And what we hope to share with you today is our approach, our thought process, our approach during the procedure itself, and certainly the post-procedure rehabilitation. And I think all of these play an integral role in having a success successful practice, practice utilizing minimally invasive tenonomy for you and your patients. So as we start, it's always difficult when we start thinking of how to identify tendons. And we certainly see people come in the office with diagnosis of shoulder impingement syndrome. They may tell you they have rotator cuff dysfunction or perhaps our favorite rotor cuff dysfunction, um, rotator cuff tear, whether it's partial or whole, bursitis, and they all want to treat it treated the same. And so what we talk about at the clinic is my dear friend and colleague, Dr. King, uh, and I discuss is we want to treat the, the underlying tendon tissue and what are we treating? And so perhaps maybe a discussion and a thought process towards how are you treating the tissue and how are you treating it different, perhaps if it displays something different. And so we under, utilize at the clinic a GK uh, protocol and we use, for example, a type three supraspinatus tendinopathy. That may be different if it was a type one and, and bursitis and they carry different treatment options. So to, in order to understand the treatment, perhaps we have to understand the tissue. So for us, we use an intratendinous content model is what we describe. And we take the variability in tendinopathy symptoms and their imaging and the responses we've seen to treatment. And that has allowed us to kind of come up with a program that demonstrates the ability to treat a tendon differently along perhaps even its course of degenerative changes. So in the first model here, what we describe as perhaps a normal tendon may actually be a tendon that demonstrates normal collagen pattern, a normal quote unquote looking ultrasound or image, but a painful exam. So that may be neural changes and maybe early changes or even fascial dis you know discrepancy, fascial thickening. A inflammatory tendon will show up certainly perhaps as hyperemia. And what we're trying to understand is this VEGF, is this interleukins, and what does this mean to the tendon and how does it relate to, to patient's pain and or function. Some patients present with purely degenerative changes. Perhaps they've passed the point of hyperemia or inflammation. Perhaps we're catching it at some other time prior to tear, et cetera. And some patients have inflammatory and degenerative and what we want to understand, do all of these patients and do all of these tendons behave the same or are they different? And that helps try to guide us in our treatment program. And so on this slide, you'll see our, what we've come up with, with a paper that we're releasing demonstrating inter and intra relator reliability. And what we're looking at here is four types of tendon and what the tendon has shown us for tendinosis and or hyperemia. And specific for this discussion, we feel that degenerative or inflammatory and degenerative tendons really respond well to minimally invasive tenotomy or TENJET. And this is what we wanna focus on today. And so when we start thinking about patient selection, part of our discussion comes certainly under examination and history but also with image finding and put all these things together, we have a guideline that will allow us to treat the sequence. And so when you talk about tears, you know, does the tear configuration matter? Can you have a partial tear? And could you have a interstitial tear? Can you have a mid substance tear, articular sided, et cetera? What about the bicep? Chromial spurring, scapular dyskinesia, 
you can have glenohumeral arthritis. So what we really like to ask ourselves and our fellows is does it really examine like rotator cuff pathology? And, and what are you dealing with? Perhaps is it, is it external or internal impingement? So we really want to focus on the examination history as well as our imaging findings. And we, we generally don't move towards any procedure, including anything from orthobiologics to minimally invasive tenotomy without having a good understanding of history and examination first. And certainly calcific tendinopathy will, will, will present a, a, as pain. So what we highlighted just here is this is a good area of tendinosis. There was no evidence of hyperemia. So this would be a GK3 tendon with degenerative change, likely underlying bursal scarring as well. This to us would be, if it examines very, very well, this is a perfect case to proceed with an MIT. So what kind of pearls can we consider? And what, what do you want to do when considering the, to implement MIT into your practice? Certainly, MSK ultrasound training is a must, and experience is key. If you are utilizing ultrasound-guided injections in your practice as second nature and part of your tool, then that is absolutely the right timing for you to do MIT. If you feel like ultrasound guided injections are perhaps difficult for you to use and may not supplement your practices easily without some consideration, then I think you want to consider maybe getting some training and becoming more comfortable because certainly you want to understand the tissue that you're addressing. And I think MIT works best when you have a mastery of that ultrasound. Uh, ultrasound diagnoses. We at the clinic are using these GK models for tendinopathy. Whatever model you decide to utilize, understanding the difference between recognition of tendinosis versus tearing versus inflammation versus normal tissue and versus post, post-surgical tissue as well. And all those are important, and that just comes with comfort and time. For our presentation, we consider when a patient, spe specifically with shoulder, if you've had a recent cortisone injection, we typically wait for about three months prior to doing the procedure. Now, we, it's, a, it's a certain hard stop if they've had a, a non-visualized or non-ultrasound guided injection, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a hard stop if it's been a uh, guided injection. But the consideration to let the anti-inflammatory properties wash out prior to us doing any procedure to the said tendon is pretty important. We think it's really important for your procedure day to be separate from your regular clinic day. We typically do 45-minute time slots, and we do not rush the procedure itself. We take the time, and because we understand that patients aren't being put asleep, there's no general anesthesia, and we do them in a procedure room in the office. So we often have family member who who are curious, and the patient's certainly awake. So we want to make sure we, we have rehearsal with the staff. They understand their roles, and we keep a very professional uh, appearance to our uh, proceedings on the day of the MIT. Uh, in our clinic, we play some music. We make sure the patient's very comfortable. We do turn the lights uh, down, and so we, we sort of mimic a, a, a hospital a surgical suite setting. And that seems to have really calmed patients and their families, and, and it's really been a quite a nice uh, addition to our practice. We advise that you continue to work with your orthopedic surgical colleagues to understand the role and help bridge the gap between non-surgical and surgical orthopedics. And that's what we do best here at the clinic, is we have good communication between people like myself, our surgical colleagues, and our physical therapy group. The physical therapy group has really been integral to incorporate our post-procedural therapy protocol. In fact, we like to implement this even at the time of the procedure or even better before. So if we can have them meet with our therapist and you can consider having them meet with your therapy team to go over what the expectations are, both before and after the procedure, has been wildly successful for patient compliance on our end. Again, the, the tissue is the issue. There are certainly times where you can get some mild tendinosis, but significant fascial scarring. We think even those 
have a great response to the MIT and its underlying uh, uh, treatment option. And it improves the overall impingement uh, process that you'll often see. And so we kind of mentioned it just briefly on a few slides before about what do I do about tears. In general, when we utilize MIT and we have significant tendinosis with or without interstitial or partial thickness tears, we tend to work. We tend to work around them. Uh, we work around the tear in the in the degenerative tendon tissue, and we've had great success. In general, we do not recommend to put the uh, probe in the tear itself and to work around it. And also, general, we want to consider full thickness tears with retraction as not an indication to do an MIT. So when it comes to positioning, there are certainly variable positions that you can consider. Many like to do the beach chair position if that works well for you and if it's appropriate that you have the right table setting. At the clinic, I have a high-low table, and so I certainly do position on the left and also position on the right. I typically prefer the position on the right as I can stand behind the patient, as I can manipulate the arm in flexion, and extension, as well as some internal external rotation to get the best look, and I can come from behind. That's generally less the nerve wracking to the patient. The ultrasound would be faced, if I'm standing behind the patient, it would be faced opposite to me or at the head of the table. The benefit of having it on the opposite side is there are very curious patients and they do like to watch the procedure. And in fact, with a dark room and the ultrasound Visualized patients do seem to get a calming effect with that and do really well with it. So these are the two positions that we prefer and we utilize most often. You will fight, likely find the best position that works for you, either one of these two, a mix in between, or perhaps even the beach chair position. So when we are doing the MIT, I want you to consider that the initial approach You'll see here on this video that we're numbing the deltoid, and we do what my fellows like to call the baklava layering approach, where we layer just small aliquots of tissue at a time with numbing medicine. And as I play it again, you'll see we add, we're adding just small amounts of lidocaine through that tissue, and we go back and forth several times before we even get down to the bursal tissue. And I think that's important. And that allows the, the patient to get properly, properly anesthetized, and the smaller aliquots do not feel like heavy pressure to the patient, and they tolerate it generally very well. And then we also talk about once we go through the deltoid and feel comfortable, a lot of people initially say it's really difficult for them to guide the probe into the desired tissue. And so one of the things that we've utilized is the addition of an 18-gauge guiding needle. Oftentimes, depending on patient size, we can either use a traditional one-and-a-half-inch needle or a spinal three. We will add that 18-gauge under ultrasound visualization, get to our target, as we would add a target here is the bursa that's highlighted in blue over top of a piece of calcium. And then we can add the MIT probe the 10 jet probe just under the 18 gauge. And then that allows us to visualize a guide track for us. And then we remove the 18 gauge and voila, you're in your area of desired treatment. And in this case, we do like to start most of our procedures with a debridement of the bursa, as you can see here. And I do a rotary technique where I like to get 360 on the tissue to remove it in all planes and make sure we're making strong, long passes at it. Uh, often the bursa will allow for several long, deep passes, as you'll see here, which can be quite successful. When considering calcium, we can see, and this may be for a lot of people who are considering the rotator cuff as a starting point for MIT, calcific tendinopathy is a home run of a treatment. As we can see here, and we'll ignore the degenerative changes, we'll see this was a very active 50-year-old weightlifter, competitive 
who had this on his shoulder, and it was very painful for him in an impingement type setting. Otherwise, he had a really pretty good range of motion. And so we were able to identify the calcium on ultrasound. And with the identification, we were able to then feel strongly about moving forward with removing it. And so, again, consider using that 18 gauge as a guide. You'll often have to break apart the calcium or at least lodge yourself into the calcium, which can at first be a bit difficult and nerve wracking to make sure you're in it. But once you're in it, you can demonstrate that you can move freely inside the calcium, again, using a, a, a pressure, a forward pressure and rotary technique, you can remove the calcium successfully and you can see it demineralize on your screen, uh, which is quite and satisfying. And then as you see, as the highlighted calcium, it's on the bottom, it's starting to become less prominent and you then see collection of the calcium particle in your bag. And that itself is, is really you know, quite satisfying for you to do. And it's really great for the patient. Now, we will also recommend that when you're treating calcific tendinopathy, our protocol would either be immediate x-ray after the procedure or an x-ray one-month follow-up. That also allows the patient to have some sense of accomplishment that the piece of calcium has been removed or reduced, and that allows them to be maybe perhaps even more compliant with the therapy. So that's been our standard, and it's worked quite well. As you can see in this patient, had the calcium and we removed it and he's doing quite well. This was done in 2017 and still doing well. Other cases, even bigger pieces of calcium have successfully been removed. So the size of it does not make us, you know, deterred to use MIT. It's a great modality for treatment of these patients. If a patient here, and I add this one for two reasons. One, you can see that there has been inferior displacement of the glenohumeral joint. The patient certainly had a lot of apprehension, a lot of pain. Uh, we reduced the majority of the calcium. So this is a great example. We reduced the majority. The rest was really hard to pick off, and we reduced it significantly. The shoulder joint had elevated back up into a near normal position, and the patient's been pain-free for quite some time. So again, TenJet has been a great addition to our practice for the treatment of both rotator cuff tendinopathy as well as calcific tendinopathy. So with that, I wanted to thank you. There are, if there are questions that are out there or discussion on your treatment protocol or questions on how to approach a patient, we're always available. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys today about the treatment of rotator cuff tendinopathy as well as calcific tendinopathy with the use of TenJet MIT. Thank you.